Good evening, everybody. Welcome to On the Right Track, connecting communities to the Hudson River. My name is Jeffrey Anzavino. I'm the Director of Land Use Advocacy at Scenic Hudson. It's so good to have you all here with us tonight. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy evening to join us and to acknowledge uh, Max Prime, who is representing Congressman Delgado's office, Lauren Montague, representing New York State Assembly Member Kevin Cahill's office. Uh, our panelists uh, will be Supervisor Robert Bury, the supervisor of the town of Germantown, Peter Molesky, owner of Peter Molesky LLC, Vanessa Cornicarni, the Chief of Staff and Legislative Director of Assembly Member Dee Dee Barrett's office, and only Major, Deputy Mayor, Village of Tivoli, Jen Crawford, the Chair of the Town of Germantown Waterfront Advisory Committee, and Miranda Miller from Representative Tonko's office. Thank you all for being here this evening. A quick note about Scenic Hudson, we're credited with launching the modern grassroots environmental movement and winning Americans' right to speak out and initiate lawsuits to protect the environment. Our success in transforming contaminated industrial sites along the Hudson River into magnificent parks has received national attention. Recognizing our pioneering work in developing and impl implementing these collaborative strategies to conserve must-save lands, Scenic Hudson received the National Land Trust Excellence Award, the highest honor bestowed in the National Land Trust Alliance in 2011. Our work from the start has been about the power of partners, focusing on people, nature, and place, with a call to citizens to support our shared enterprise in a time of unprecedented challenges. Of course, connecting people to the power and the majesty of the Hudson River is one of Scenic Hudson's key goals, something I'm personally interested in, and that's why we're gathered here this evening. Now, I want to let you know that we've got uh, a polling question just to find out a little bit about who's tuning in. We'll have another polling question later on this evening. Um, but uh, Jason, uh, you want to queue up that polling question? There we go. Let us know how you access and enjoy the Hudson River and what types of activities you enjoy. We'll take just a moment. Please do. All right. Poll, uh, Jason, is the poll over? There we go. Yeah, it looks like uh, most people use the river at public parks, official access points, um, but about 45% of you do use the river at informal places that aren't parks, um, and a, a few use at other places. And uh, for the most part, bird and nature watching, fishing, boating, uh, a lot of shoreline hiking going on there, 77%, tied for first place, 29% others. I thank you very much for uh, participating in that poll. We appreciate it. Um, throughout the evening, uh, we're going to encourage you to use the Q&A box to drop your questions in, your thoughts, um, something you'd like to share with us, and then we'll be answering all of these during the Q&A at the end of the session. So why are we here tonight anyway? Um, why are we spending this steamy August night in front of our computers where, I don't know, I've been there all day long. Uh, we could be out on the river, we could be fishing, we could be doing something out connecting with nature. Uh, so I thank you all for making this sacrifice. We're here to empower each other to work together to provide stronger connections to the Hudson River and when need be, do what we must to protect the access that we now enjoy. 
Scenic Hudson has created many parks along the Hudson, but there are still a lot of places where for miles and miles, people just can't safely get down to the river to launch a boat, to swim, to fish, or just marvel at the river's day-to-day -day beauty. During this pandemic, we've all realized just how important it is to get outside and enjoy nature. Now, more than ever, we need places and ways to get down to the Hudson River. Unfortunately, one of the Hudson Valley's greatest assets also presents a great challenge to river access, and that's the railroads that for most of the river's length line both its shores. I've been working to increase and enhance river access for about 30 years now, and I've seen efforts to close grade crossings like at Newton Hook in the town of Stuyvesant, in the village of Tivoli, at the Riverfront Park. Uh, a grade crossing actually closed at Castleton on Hudson about 25 years ago. Uh, even in my hometown of Highland, CSX had the town install a guide rail to keep people from parking along the road just to look at the river, the moonrise, fireworks. I've seen centrally old truss bridges continue to fall in disrepair. A gate south of Hudson kept anglers from a not so fish secret fishing hole called East Jesus. And the bridge at Cold Dock Lane to Hyde Park was actually closed by DOT for eight months just this past year. But there have also been some victories. That Cold Duck Lane Bridge has now been repaired and reopened. The Calvert Vox Preservation Alliance secured a Hudson River Valley Greenway grant to take the first steps in assessing the historic trust bridge at Mills Norrie State Park. Once it's repaired and reopened, people will be able to enter the park and approach Hoyt House, which is a National Historic Landmark, along the carriage road that was designed by Calvert Vox himself. Finally, in the town of Marlboro, Supervisor Al Lanzetta and Council Member Howard Baker petitioned New York State DOT and secured approval to improve the at-grade crossing to Milton Landing Park, which is now under development. CSX wanted a grade-separated overpass. So there's a good win for the, the town of Marlboro right there. Congratulations to the town. The loss of river access is incremental. It's one thing here and one thing there. Before we know it, we may turn around and find that just there's just a handful of places left that we can enjoy the Hudson River. And now with trains going faster and faster, we've seen efforts to keep people off the tracks with a series of proposed gates and fencing, four and a half miles of fencing between Poughkeepsie and Rensselaer. And I must say, I agree that people don't belong on the tracks. It's dangerous, not just for the river rats like me and maybe you, but also for the people riding the trains. But I also believe that there are ways to keep people off the tracks and out of harm's way without sacrificing river access. And that's what we're gonna learn about tonight. So that's why we're here tonight in front of our computers, instead of being at our favorite riverfront park, boat or shoreline. Next slide. So I'd like to start with a brief summary of what's happened over the past three and a half years. And throughout the evening, we'll hear what people are doing to protect and increase shoreline access in ways that can reduce risk along the rail line. Finally, we'll discuss what you can do to be part of this effort. You might recall that in 2018, Amtrak proposed a series of gates and fences along the, ma gates along the maintenance road and fencing along the corridor in eight locations in five municipalities between Rhinebeck and Stuyvesant. Because Amtrak is a federal agency, the New York State Department of State requires that state and local coastal policies must be complied with. These policies say, in effect, thou shalt not reduce river access, and thou shalt protect views. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically it. And the Department of State is vitally in interested in protecting water-related recreational uses. This term is very important, water-related recreational uses. That's fishing, boating, swimming, ice boating, duck hunting. There may, may be others, but that's what comes to mind. So in support of community efforts and understanding that Tivoli and Castleton were being required to construct at grade, they were grade separated crossings to access their small riverfront parks and that Amtrak was proposing 750 feet long fence along Lower Main Street in Germantown, a place where people use the river for boating, swimming and fishing. I did some research and found that there were engineering standards that actually provided ways to get people across the tracks at grade without requiring these grade crossings. Uh, overpasses are not always required. So in order to support the community, Scenic Hudson hired McLaren Engineering 
to conduct some research, document these places, and make some recommendations for Amtrak, Amtrak's uh, Empire Corridor South Hudson Line. Now, the result was a white paper called At Grade Passenger Rail, Pedestrian, and Trail Crossings. Due to the large outpouring of community concern about the loss of shoreline access, places where people had fished and boated, duck hunted for generations, New York State Department of State and DOT, Department of Transportation, directed Amtrak to go back to the drawing board, come up with a five-year plan and involve municipal officials and community when they develop these plans for gates and fences. Then with some time on our side, Cena Hudson hired Peter Maluski and Alta to document the places where people use the Hudson River in this study area between Poughkeepsie and Rensselaer. Uh, the result was the Hudson River Access Plan, published in March 2020, just as the pandemic hit. And this plan did a lot more than document the places where people use the river. The plan was based on public involvement. I'm sure many of you were at the meetings. We had six meetings over a period of two nights, and they were um, in Castleton on Hudson, Germantown, and Rhinebeck. Uh, about 300 people attended those meetings. We had a thousand different comments come in and, and also uh, 5,500 votes about how people use the river. Um, as I said, shoreline access was documented where people use the river and how they used it. The public trust doctrine was described in this plan and there were several recommendations. Uh, the plan recommended a collaborative approach to addressing safety and access goals, uh, taking a regional approach to shoreline access, uh, the plan identified a lot of these truss bridges. There were 12 that were in poor condition, uh, repairing these truss bridges so they could be reopened. And then pilot programs to find places where at-grade pedestrian crossings could be established. Next slide. So, Some of the main things that came out of this, uh, out of the past year and as the plan was implemented was uh, first a series of letters were exchanged between representatives Tonko, Delgado, and Maloney. And the letters asked Amtrak to take a step back to, uh, they expressed concern about the loss of access and requested that they, that Amtrak engage the community and municipal officials as they develop their five-year fencing program. And they also, asked Amtrak to take a look at examples around the country where, the, where people were using at-grade crossings on high-speed rail lines. Um, Amtrak, of course, deferred the plan. Um, then uh, I want to thank Supervisor Rob Dury, um, Supervisor Elizabeth Spinzia, who can't be here this evening, who sent letters on behalf of seven municipalities and, uh, and counties requesting the New York State Department of State assistance in creating a regional shoreline access plan. Um, I've spoken to some Department of State staff. They explained to me that the, um, it would take a long time to create such a plan, it would be expensive, and they suggested that municipalities, when they develop their local waterfront revitalization programs or improve them, that they use the data findings and recommendations in the Hudson River Access Plan uh, to inform their plan. So I think that's good advice, and I hope they'll do that. Uh, there was also a cultural resource survey done on trust bridges. And that was uh, funded by the um, Preservation League of New York State. Uh, Peter Maluski is going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we already mentioned that the Cold Dock Lane Trust Bridge was, uh, had, that had been closed at about that same time uh, was repaired in a, in a very creative collaboration. Um, and as a result, uh, the three remaining trust bridges of the 12 were listed on the National Register of Historic Places. They have protection under Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act. And that's the bridges at Crum Elbow, the FDR site, um, Cold Dock Lane, and the former Dominican camp where Scenic Hudson has some property. Um, then the um, Calvert Vox Preservation Alliance applied for a Greenway grant. They secured that grant. They'll be taking the first steps to um, fix that bridge. And there uh, is a federal transportation bill that has some uh, 
working its way through the, the process that has some uh, provisions for access for uh, notification by Amtrak when they're proposing any projects along um, trails. Next slide. So now we're going to turn it over to Peter Maliski, and he's going to talk about the historic Trust Bridge initiative. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Jeff. And uh, let's get a discussion going on historic trust bridges. I think uh, Jeff provided a good overview of how we got to this point. Next slide. Let me go back one. There we go. So Jeff mentioned 2020, the Hudson River Access Plan was issued in, I think, March of 2020. There was a number of recommendations. Uh, a good thing about the Hudson River Access Plan, it's not you uh, pre-printed it and put it on the shelf. It's a living document. There's already been one addendum that has been issued on Hudson River Access Plan that you can find on Scenic Hudson's website. Uh, one of the action items was to pursue the 12 historic bridges that we uh, discovered as part of the HRAP public outreach process. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, there was a Preservation League grant uh, that uh, was attained by Scenic Hudson in 2020, which led to the um, issuance of the Historic Steel Trust Bridges Cultural Resource Survey in the spring of 2021. And basically, this is an official document of all 12 bridges on not only the bridges, but the corridor, why these bridges are important from a historical standpoint, from the Hudson River Valley, from a river access standpoint, uh, and also from a civil engineering standpoint. The bridge you see on the cover is the Poets Walk Bridge uh, at Poets uh, Park. And uh, that's also a shot taken from, uh, the bridge is closed right now, but that's a shot taken from the bridge, uh, looking out on the river where you have just tremendous multi-mile views in both directions at the end of the bridge. Next slide. So quickly, uh, if you haven't seen the report, again, you can go on the Scenic Custom website or just Google the name of the document, it'll pop right up. Uh, there was 12 bridges that were reviewed as part of this study. And uh, the mileposts that you see in the center column are the Amtrak or CSX mileposts. And the first bridge on the southern end of the, uh, the list is the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Crum Elbow project at 78.05 in Hyde Park. And uh, the interesting thing about this project was that all 12 bridges from FDR down to Midwood and Claremont at 102.01, there's 12 historic bridges within 24 miles, which is quite a concentration of bridges built in the early 1900s that are still in existence and, and speaking volumes about our, our past and our future. And in fact, if you take Claremont out and just look at the, uh, the first 11, they're within, uh, there's 11 bridges and 16 miles. And it's, there's a combination, FDR is obviously on a National Historic Site. Um, we have um, several bridges that are on scenic Hudson property, a number of bridges that are on state park lands, and the rest of them bridge uh, across private properties. Next. All right, so as Jeff mentioned, in 2021, the Historic Steel Trust Bridges Cultural Resource Survey, uh, as a result of that document, SHPO determined that three of the bridges, FDR, Crum Elbow, Cold Dock Lane, and the former Dominican Camp, were now eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. This affords protection under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act from 1966. What this means that it you would have to go through a lot of hoops uh, in order to remove one of these bridges. Um, the idea is to make sure these bridges stay upright, are maintained, and uh, preserved for future generations. So these three bridges now join the other nine bridges that were previously protected, and all 12 are now protected. Next slide. So a little history on these bridges, because uh, a lot of people ask, well, what kind of loads can they handle today and so forth? And what were they originally designed for and used for? So I thought we'd give you a couple quick photos. Um, a couple of the bridges uh, were designed for just a six ton wagon, which means in addition to their own weight, the, the heaviest load they could handle was a six ton wagon. So either it was for commerce, uh, or for access for farmers' property to get access to the river and so forth. So here's a, a typical vehicle you would see from 1912. 
and the uh, dog is on there as a bonus since today is International Dog Day. Next slide. Okay, the rest of the bridges, about 10 of the 12 bridges were designed for a 13 ton road roller. And again, that's the live load design vehicle the engineers would design the bridge to carry. Um, so, and when we look at the bridges today and what they can handle when we restore them, we have to keep this in mind that, and when we talk about Cold Dock Lane in a second, they're only allowed to go up to 13 tons. Next slide. Cold Dock Lane Bridge, as Jeff mentioned, uh, it was closed in early 2020. There was concerns about some of the, the condition of some of the structural steel underneath the, uh, the wood deck. Um, DOT hired an engineering firm to go out and do an inspection of the bridge, and they red flagged uh, several of the structural members. A red flag means uh, that immediate attention has to be taken uh, to repair the bridge or it has to be closed. So in this case, um, the bridge was closed because one of the issues we, we were having along the Hudson River corridor here is that, and the, the phrase you've heard this before is, um, uh, basically then abandoned bridges or orphan bridges where no one is accepting ownership for the bridge. Um, it was used to be Conrail, then it was CSX, then CSX is suggesting it went over to Amtrak. Amtrak uh, has stated in the past that it's not, the main bridge is, is not there to maintain or to own. So that was problematic in trying to figure out how to address this bridge. Uh, the closure created immediate concerns for the community is that it services the Rogers Point Boating Association and the marina. There's three homes on the riverside. There's a US Coast Guard navigational beacon. Uh, Hyde Park's municipal water intake is on the other side of the bridge and it has to be maintained occasionally. Um, and one thing about these bridges, this is a Warren Trust bridge, very typical of the time, although they are rare nowadays in that um, while very sturdy workhorse bridges they are non-redundant, which meaning if there's one main member of the bridge that fails, uh, it's a good chance that the entire bridge will fail. So that's certainly that's something you don't want to happen over the Amtrak train tracks. Next slide. Okay, so after much discussions between a number of parties uh, and a lot of facilitation help from Scenic Hudson and um, uh, the um, Rogers Point Marina um, and Amtrak, as well as DOT, uh, design plans were put together and this emergency repair work began on November 30th of last year. On December 8th, the repairs were completed and the lessons, you'll see a couple of photos in a minute. We've learned a lot of lessons from this bridge about how these, the older structures are, are put together and how to rehab them in a timely and cost-effective manner over a live railroad tracks. And then December 9th, um, the, uh, the plans were accepted and by DOT and the bridge was reopened for a 10 ton limit, which would allow um, oil trucks to go over and service the marina and the homes for the winter. And I really wanna point out that this was a fast track pod project made possible through a collaborative private public effort. Participants included the Boating Association, Scenic Hudson, Harrison Burroughs, bridge constructors, uh, GPI, a design firm who put the repair details together, NYSDOT, Amtrak, Hyde Park, and County of Dutchess. So this was all pulled off with, and the bridge reopened without anyone claiming ownership of the bridge, which is phenomenal. And uh, we're looking to, re to uh, do that again with a couple of bridges that we're looking at for the near future. Next. All right, so I'll show you a couple of slides. So if you have an interest in one of the other 12 bridges and a few of them are open now, they're not all closed and are interested in how to get them restored. This is some of the issues you have to go through. So the bridges are, you have a, a steel truss on each side. Um, they get a nice rust patina over the years and then the, the rusting stops. The rust surface actually protects it from rusting further uh, on the top. Um, so you have a, a th three inch wood planks uh, that are supported by wood longitudinal stringers that you go that run along the length of the bridge. You can see them in the middle. And the wood stringers are supported by uh, steel floor beams that go from left to right across your screen. And the problem with Cold Dock Lane Bridge was two of these floor beams 
were right over the uh, Amtrak tracks. And because of their over the Amtrak tracks, that was part of the problem. They were never maintained properly because access uh, was an issue. Next slide. Okay. So this is uh, Harrison Burroughs crew that are out on the site. Uh, the first thing I do, I take the deck off. They had, they're working with uh, Amtrak providing uh, uh, train protection. They had to carefully remove all the original uh, wood stringers from the bridge. They were in very good shape. Um, a, a bridge, just like a building, um, after 100 years, it kind of settles and finds its own little comfort level. And a number of these stringers were really wedged in there very tight. So it took them a while to get these, these stringers out. Um, and they were they were saved and reused. Next. All right, this is one of the steel floor beams that was right over Amtrak. And um, as you can see from the, the floor beam, the, the wooden stringers would sit onto this floor beam being nestled in there and then the wood deck would be on top. Uh, you will see some in the middle of the floor beam, you'll see blue sky coming through the floor beam. That's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be a solid piece of uh, metal and um, it was already starting to fail. Uh, it was a good thing there wasn't an overloaded truck that went over the bridge. Um, it, essentially this, this repair was caught just in time before something uh, serious would have happened. Okay, next. And the bridge was reopened on December 8th uh, at, for in time for the first snowfall of the year with a 10 ton weight limit. All right, and that's what we're trying to do with some of these other bridges going forward. Next slide. Okay, uh, Jeff mentioned the Hoyt Carriageway Bridge. Uh, that is the next uh, project we're looking at right now. Uh, the, um, the slides that we have here are select slides from June 3rd, 2020, a virtual presentation uh, done by uh, John Lawson, chairman of the Covered Box Preservation Alliance, uh, myself and Jeff. As you can see, the, the bridge design is, is similar to the other bridge. This is a three-span bridge where the uh, cold dock lane was one span. Uh, you can see the wood deck is in very poor condition and uh, uh, New York State Parks, which owns the property on both sides, has it currently closed to the public. Next slide. Okay, so this is a uh, just a map showing the location of the Hoyt Carriageway Bridge. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, it winds through the Ogden and Ruth Livingston Mill State Park. as a beautiful old uh, carriageway road that leads to the historic Hoyt House. Next slide. And here's an artistic rendering of the point in the Hoyt House. Next slide. Okay, so here's the bridge. Um, you, you see the truss in the middle span, similar to Cold Dock Lane. And uh, on the end, each end, there's a short uh, concrete approach spans, and the three spans are supported by concrete piers. Next slide. This, this slide will take a little bit, uh, it's, it's worth the explanation. So on the bottom of the slide, you'll see two columns, concrete columns coming up from the, the ground. Uh, and then there's a concrete cap beam across that that ties the two together. And above that, uh, on, we're looking, e we're near the tracks and we're looking east and you'll see the concrete end span. Now, back in 1912, 1913, uh, precast using concrete was kind of rare. Um, is kind of unique. So these are concrete beams with a concrete slab. Um, and uh, again, it was designed for 10 tons. So uh, it's difficult to increase it further because they put just enough reinforcement steel in these uh, concrete beams to support 10 tons, not to support a higher load. In the middle, you'll see the bottom underneath the truss and you get a good idea, view of the, uh, the wood uh, stringers that I was showing from the Cold Dock Lane project and how they're supported by the steel floor beams. And then you'll see some X-shaped members. The X-shaped members are uh, cross diagonals. And what they do is they just keep uh, the bridge in balance um, and square under live load and so forth. And uh, one thing you might not be able to see is above those concrete columns, you'll see uh, silver uh, 
steel stubs. So back in 1988, uh, this happened to probably on six out of 12 bridges. Uh, CSX was looking at uh, bringing double stacked cars onto the rail lines. So they went through and they raised a number of these bridges. And in this case, I believe this bridge is raised about 16 to 18 inches. So what they did, they jacked up the bridge, uh, they get that extra height, and then they filled in the approach slant, uh, spans to uh, make up that difference. So there's a lot of fill on those approach spans that uh, they really weren't designed for. So it's an additional dead load or additional weight that those spans are carrying that we have to take in consideration going forward. Next slide. Okay, so let's reopen the Hoyt Carriageway Bridge. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, we have a, uh, an aggressive but realistic goal of reopening the bridge and the carriageway by Memorial Day 2022. Now, we're not gonna open it for, or, for vehicles, we're going to open it for pedestrian and pedestrian, pedestrian and bicycle use, and perhaps an occasional maintenance pickup from New York State Parks. So there's been close coordination uh, with New York State Parks and with the local stakeholders uh, going forward on so far this year. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Calvert Vox Preservation Alliance was awarded the Hudson River Valley Greenway grant. It is a 50% match. Uh, which means the, for every dollar that the Alliance spends, they'll match up to 50%, um, up to a certain amount. So it is a match program so that the Alliance has to put the money up first and to get reimbursed as, as we move along on the project. So what are the next steps? The first step is to finalize coordination with Amtrak. Uh, I've been working with representatives with Amtrak the last couple of months. And uh, I think we're very close to have a coordination plan on how to go out under and inspect the underside of the bridge in a cost-effective manner. Um, and they've also providing insight on how the bridge in their perspective should be rehabbed. So once that's done, we're hoping to have that done early in the fall, uh, the bridge inspection and this will be completed and a historic structure report will be written for this bridge. And the historic structure report will just provide a quick overview on the importance of the structure, why it needs to be rehabbed and reopened, and it'll talk about the scope and the cost involved with reopening it, and also where the funds are gonna come from to do that. Phase two would be actual design and construction and reopening the bridge in the first six months of 2022. Uh, right now, um, the Vox Preservation Alliance is looking to start fundraising in earnest. In September 2021, uh, there's been discussions about uh, items such as a GoFundMe page. They have gotten inquiries from certain individuals and organizations that are already interested in contributing. So the first, uh, the immediate goal right now is uh, to fund the phase one matching funds. Uh, we also are accepting donations for phase two as well. So if we get, get more money than we need for phase one, that money will be rolled into the phase two into the opening of the bridge. Uh, you can contact the Alliance if you want to make a donation, just mark the donation as the Hoyt Bridge so it goes to the right uh, location. And okay, next slide. Okay, this is my last slide. And uh, this is from the, the um, Cultural Resource Survey report. Um, this is the FDR Crumb Elbow Bridge in Hyde Park. Why do we want to restore this historic bridge? Well, it provides important access between the FDR National Historic Site, the Hyde Park Trail, and the Hudson River shoreline. Uh, two, Amtrak passenger and employee safety. Uh, the, there is some structural issues with the steel members right over the tracks, and it needs to be addressed in a timely manner. Uh, it's the only shoreline access at the FDR National Historic Site. A Cromwell, as most of you know, is the site where Henry Hudson anchored a ship, the Half Moon, in 1609. And finally, uh, there's been discussion about Hudson River Greenway Walter Trail site that could be established that would provide paddlers with a way to land on the shoreline and hike from the FDR home and library, as well as the Henry Wallace Center. And similar to the, uh, the Hoyt Bridge we just showed you, the, the truss is similar. It's one span, which makes it easier. It's actually easier to fix. Um, and um, the, like most of these bridges, the wood decking and the wood 
is totally shot and has to be replaced. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Jeff. Thanks, Peter. I was uh, I'd like to just take this opportunity to um, introduce Miranda Miller of Representative Tonko's office. I actually intended to do that at the beginning, um, and she was just going to give a, an overview of uh, Representative Tonko's, uh, what he's been doing to help communities uh, protect their access to the river. Yeah, no worries. Happy to jump in. Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm Miranda. I work for Congressman Paul Tonko in his DC office, uh, but I'm also a native of the capital region. So very glad to be here and grateful to everyone at Scenic Hudson for putting on this webinar and for the work that you all do to preserve our Hudson River and historic Hudson Valley. Um, I'll just be sharing a brief update on Congressman Tonko's work to protect access to the uh, river waterfronts. As many of you know, the Congressman grew up in the Mohawk Hudson Valley. Uh, so its natural landscapes and waterfronts were formative in developing his passion for protecting access to those places. Um, and as Jeff did mention, um, in recent years, waterfront development, including ra railroad fencing and safety programs, have posed challenges to public shoreline access. And Congressman Tonko is strongly committed to balancing those safety ra railroad safety needs with improving access to the waterfront and working with communities, local officials, and stakeholders to find the best ways to do that. And it's great to see many of those groups and individuals here on this call. Uh, so to just mention a few actions that he has taken recently to help meet those goals. Um, Jeff mentioned that in March of last year, Congressman Tonko, along with Congressman Delgado and Maloney, sent a letter to the president and CEO of Amtrak, urging them to delay their applications and take more time to work with local communities to improve their fencing proposals. And the congressman has continued to call on Amtrak to do more to address the concerns of local communities and utilize the recommendations in Scenic Hudson's Hudson River Access Plan. Uh, the congressman and, and our whole team are looking forward to continuing to work with Amtrak and, and all of you to find that healthy balance of managing safety and not just maintaining, but expanding public shoreline access for the region, whether that takes the shape of provisions in the infrastructure package being negotiated as we speak in the house or work further down the road uh, or both. Um, and to help us do that, we want to hear your stories. So please do not hesitate to contact our office to share the challenges with shoreline access that you're experiencing in your home communities. Um, always a big help to us. We're always eager to hear your thoughts. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thank you again for having me and, and to all of you watching for joining us. Thanks so much, Miranda. And please extend our collective thanks to Representative Tonko for all he's done for us. Really appreciate it. Uh, Peter, can you uh, give us uh, an overview of uh, federal funding opportunities? I think that's next. Uh, sure, sure. I'll just give uh, people a quick overview. As, as you know, infrastructure has been uh, front and center on the news for, for a number of months now, and obviously uh, Congressman Tonko's office is heavily involved with that as well. Uh, just as some, some quick numbers for everyone is uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the IIJA, it's called is uh, nationally a $1.2 trillion program to be spent over eight years. It offers 110 billion for roads, bridges, and major transportation. Uh, it includes $40 billion in new funding for bridge rehabilitation replacement, and also includes nationally $66 billion for passenger rail. Uh, and, and out of that 66 billion, a lot of it is, uh, earmarked for Amtrak uh, for work in the Northeast. A lot of it's for the corridor between uh, Washington DC and, uh, and Boston. Um, how much of that funding that would be available for the Empire's corridor, which runs from uh, New York to, to Buffalo. Uh, I haven't seen those numbers or and we're more interested in the Empire corridor South, which is Albany to New York City. But, um, needless to say, Amtrak's going to see a, a good influx of, of cash in the next few years. Um, in New York State, regarding uh, uh, bridges in particular, uh, there's a minimum of $1.5 billion, according to a recent release by Senator Schumer, uh, for bridges in New York State. Um, and uh, again, going back, there's a lot of more money for roads and uh, other uh, uh, road-related pertinences that, that could be used for things such as uh, at-grade crossing um, technology. 
And that's a quick overview, Jeff. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, next slide, Jason. Here we go. Now we're going to hear from Vanessa Corner Kamornicki. You're very close, yes. <laughs> Thank you, if you're understanding. She's going to explain what Assemblymember Edie Barrett is, is doing to um, help um, address some of the liability issues. And we've had one question in the chat, and we'll, 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 we'll get to that after 8 o'clock. This may uh, go on a long way to answering that question. Vanessa? Okay. Thank All right. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank Sina Cutson for inviting our office to participate in this event. Uh, Assemblymember Dee Dee Barrett sends her regrets for being unable to attend this evening. I am Vanessa Komernicki, Assemblymember Barrett's Chief of Staff and Legislative Director. Uh, as many of you know, Assemblymember Barrett cares a great deal about preserving public access to the Hudson River and has been monitoring this issue closely and stepping in when appropriate. Uh, she sponsors legislation, Assembly Bill A2016, that was first introduced in February of 2019 in response to the many concerns our office heard from municipalities, individual constituents, and organizations such as Scenic Hudson and Riverkeeper. Uh, this bill puts forth a new concept and supports the creation of Rails with Trails, a model in trail planning in which trails are built alongside active railroads, often using the railroad right of way. Many railroad corridors experience uh, issues with trespassing, but the Rails with Trails model provides a safe and legal way to make use of otherwise underutilized land and allow the public to access and enjoy the recreational opportunities along the property. This model has been implemented in other parts of the country. Uh, and yet we do, we have the pictures. Okay, <laughs> here we have the pictures of the San Clemente uh, Beach Trail in California. Uh, before this trail was constructed and, and permitted, uh, people walked alongside the tracks creating, creating an informal cow path and crossed wherever they pleased. Uh, as you can imagine, this created a hazardous condition. That's why the city of San Clemente and Orange County Transportation Authority applied in 2003 to the California Coastal Commission to formalize the trail with fencing and a series of safe crossings, both grade separated and at grade. So the goal of assembly member Barrett's legislation is to encourage the creation of rails with trails and other recreational trails here in New York State. To do this, the bill clarifies that property owners who allow recreational access to their property are exempt from liability and protected from actions resulting in injury or death. This legislation is based on recommendations from the Federal Highway Administration and ultimately removes the potential barrier to trail creation of property owner liability. This bill is under review by the Assembly Judiciary Committee chaired by Assembly Member Charles Levine and the companion bill S678 sponsored by Senator Peter Harkham is under review by the Senate Judiciary Committee chaired by Senator Brad Hoylman. The legislative process in general is not an easy one and shepherding a bill from its first introduction to it being signed into law can sometimes be an uphill battle. Uh, one of the most important things that individuals, communities, and organizations can do to assist in this process is to write a letter in support of the legislation and send it to the sponsors of the bill and the chair of the committee reviewing the bill. Uh, this contact information will be included in follow-up materials should you wish to convey your support. So thank you for your time. Thanks. And so we appreciate that. And uh, please extend thanks to Assembly Member Barrett. And uh, yes, uh, everyone who has signed up to be uh, to join us at this webinar will get a follow up email from us with all that contact information. We hope that you will um, support uh, this bill. Um, Thank next, you. Yeah, yeah. Next, uh, we're going to hear from uh, the Deputy Mayor of Tivoli, Emily Major. And, um, you know, I, I heard that Tivoli was required uh, to. Um, 
to have a, a great separated uh, crossing when access was going to be required uh, for their village park. And, um, and I've been working closely with the mayor for, uh, for many years now. And um, we're going to hear from Emily now and explain the situation there in Tivoli and what they'd like to do to uh, secure good access to the river. Park. Emily? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm happy to be here on behalf of the village of Tivoli. And I just want to say thank you to Scenic Hudson uh, for being extraordinary allies and advocates um, for all of the you know, riverfront communities. And, um, and Scenic Hudson has definitely helped us out a lot. Um, so Tivoli, it would not be would not be here if not for the river um, and the I mean the access to the river. Um, what you're looking at on this slide is is an advertisement from 1796, where um, the easy shore and healthy situation are being uh, used to uh, promote a planned community. Uh, Could I have the next slide, please? So um, by 1728 or so, there were already um, mills. And by the mid-1700s, uh, there was a ferry going across to Saugerties. And by about 1785, there were New York City manufacturers and um, merchants who had warehouses in Tivoli. And they were um, shipping things down the river and internationally. So, the river, like we, we are a river facing community, or at least we, we were. Um, can I have the next slide, please. By the 1840s, um, you can see this is a view from the north. Um, looking down, we're, we're situated on the east side of the river, and you can see these um, docks that are uh, stretching out into the river with warehouses on them, and you it's a uh, you've got a sloop and uh, steamboats, and you're sort of seeing the, the evolution going on. And it was about 10 years later that the train um, cut, the, uh, cut off the access, but the ferries kept going until I believe the 1950s. Um, and the, the um, steamboats kept taking uh, produce down to the city and um, that exchange kept on. So we've really taken advantage of every kind of transportation opportunity uh, along our waterfront over the years. Um, may I have the next slide? So this is the um, early 1900s where you can sort of see that happening. You can see the, the big uh, steamboat in the background and our little train station. And, um, and we actually did have a pedestrian overpass uh, at that time so that people could safely get across to the dock on the ferry. Um, next slide. Um, but everything down at the at the uh, waterfront, there were there were fires and other disasters in the early 1900s, and uh, you know the waterfront is pretty empty now. But there is a uh, there is an act grade crossing at Diana Street, and you know, people people use the river quite a bit. Um, and it became clear that Tivoli really had something to protect. Um, so about 30 years ago, um, the conversation started about how do we, how do we hold on to control of our little bit of the river? Um, you may have the next slide. Um, you know, we want to hang on to the to the access because you know this is where. Uh, you know, where we started, you see the little history slide there from 1795, our map. And we have uh, a robust community of striper fishermen and really quite avid bird watchers. And, um, and also it's a, it's a great draw that, you know, brings people in and benefits our, our local restaurants and businesses. Um, so, the, may I have the next slide? So we wanted to secure the permanent access and you know, continue uh, you know, to utilize uh, our little bit of, of the access point. And you know, the environment, uh, you know, the, the barges um, as they come up and down the river, the channel is quite close to Tivoli. And so 
um, you can see at sort of the, the crook of the L, uh, the red L on the, uh, on the top section there, um, the blue line is our shoreline, but the, the red area is where uh, the docks actually used to come out to. So there, there was a huge footprint. Um, so the first thing we had to do was identify the stakeholders that we would need to be talking to. And that would be the DEC and, you know, 30 years ago it was CSX and, um, and now it's Amtrak and then the Army Corps of Engineers and the Village of Tivoli. Um, and we had to all start talking about how we could purchase um, a, a bit of land. And um, thanks to Scenic Hudson, we were able to secure a little more than two acres uh, on both sides of the tracks. And we've been, so that was in 2010, but then there's Tivoli's like conundrum because the terms of the, um, the agreement were that um, the railroad said, once we put a shovel in the ground to do anything on the west side of the tracks, um, the at-grade crossing would have to be um, closed and we would need to fence the area. And um, so it's, you can see there's a little green, a little green area that links the two, um, the two lots of land. And that is the easement that we have um, for a crossing. And it's just north of the Diana Street crossing. Um, and you can see that the footprint on the other side, on the west side is uh, quite small of, of appreciable land. Could I have the next slide, please? So the challenge is how do we get people safely across the tracks? And this is, this is what we've been pondering. Um, could we tunnel under it? Turns out no, um, because the water comes up high enough that there's, there's just not room. Uh, there's definitely not room for a car overpass um, you know, there is a historical precedent for a pedestrian overpass with stairs, but we do have um, ADA compliance issues and, um, you know, a, a lot of people who use the river are, are putting in kayaks and, you know, that, that won't work. So, you know, it seemed that we, we got a, um, help from RPI. There were some engineering students in 2015 who who looked at the issue and uh, came up with this idea, which was a uh, an overpass um, with stairs and elevators. Um, and we talked about, you know, maybe with, with uh, you know a way to transport boats on the elevators across the tracks. And uh, but again, it's you know with the limited location of the easement and. Um, the footprint of a structure like this, it's really hard to see how that would how that would actually work. And then also, we are in the National Historic Landmark District, so you know visual impacts are taken into consideration. And at the same time, you know access is so important. Um, it's the only direct public access uh, to the river in the town of Red Hook. So. Um, We've just been, you know, sort of in a um, a holding pattern. You know, we we've we've secured our our access, but um, we're not really sure how we can move forward. You know, ideally, an at grade crossing uh, would be ideal, and we you know people still do go, go across the tracks, and um, and then the police come and pretty unpleasant. Um, so we're, we're just um, hoping that, you know, a, a safe at grade crossing alternative can be found. So, and, and also in the meantime, we're just proceeding with tiny steps. Like um, we got a grant a few years ago to, um, to do the engineering and planning for a walkway, uh, you know, a linear park from the village down to the river. Um, you know, so we've got that, you know, on the books waiting. And, um, and we just got a grant from the Department of State in order to stabilize the shoreline um, 
which will be happening, I believe, in the fall. So that's great. And we had hoped at first to be able to um, sort of reclaim our shoreline back out to the historic bulkheads, uh, which would have given us, you know, a nice bit of land. But, uh, but it turns out that's not going to be allowable. So that's where we are right now. Um, not terrible, but it could certainly be better. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Emily. Uh, next slide, Jason. So one of the leaders in um, securing their shoreline access has been the town of Germantown, their waterfront advisory committee, and a subcommittee of that, the local waterfront revitalization uh, committee. Uh, they understand that they can use the power of an LWRP to determine their own future. So now we're going to hear from Jen Crawford, the chair of the town of Germantown Local Waterfront Revitalization Committee. Jen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks for having me. And um, also thanks to Scenic Hudson for all the work you guys have done to help unify the Hudson River towns to fight for river access rights. Um, so Germantown is a small river, uh, river town in Southern Columbia County, just north of Tivoli, actually. Um, you know, we're, we're a river town. Our mascot is the clipper ship. Um, our fire department has two boats. If there's an emergency on the river. We're the ones that come. Um, and so the river, much, the river is very much a part of our town's identity. We happen to have two riverside parks, actually, with um, a really interesting bit of land. We have two and a half miles of a shoreline path connecting them, which has been informally and safely used by the public for decades. Um, and so we have something really special to protect in Germantown. So the vision that you're looking at, this was established through Germantown's local waterfront revitalization strategy process. That's an LWRS. We started that in 2016 or so. It was a two-year research and consensus building project uh, that we completed in spring of 2018. Um, we did an inventory and analysis, a lot of public outreach, um, and the process was very informative and inspiring. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, the LWRS was originally advertised to us as kind of the cheaper, shorter, quicker version of an LWRP. Um, and then we learned as we were finalizing the study in 2018 that an LWRS has no regulatory impact. Um, we learned that when Amtrak proposed gates and fences along our shoreline, uh, restricting access to the river. So um, we learned that we needed to have an LWRP. The P is significant. It's um, kind of the full version, and the P stands for a program. So an LWRP um, gives us the ability to have say on, uh, say on federal projects, uh, whether they're projects by a federal agency. I have an example of that or whether they're projects that are submitting for a federal permit. So I have another example of that. We've had, we've had both in Germantown. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide. Um, so the first example project is the Amtrak gates and fences proposal that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, Amtrak proposed to install gates and fences that would restrict access to miles of Germantown's shoreline. Um, and so because Amtrak is at least a partially federally funded organization, um, they were required to go through coastal consistency review with the New York State Department of State. And so through the coastal consistency review, uh, if Germantown had had an LWRP, the applicant would have had to be consistent with our locally defined policies. Um, in this case, even though we had just finished this two-year process with, uh, through, with the DOS through an LWRS, um, Germantown wasn't even notified that there was an application. We actually learned of the application through word of mouth um, because neighboring communities with approved LWRPs, like Tivoli, um, were directly notified of the application and invited to review and comment. Um, I have another example. If you go to the next slide, more recently, um, there was a three barge mooring, which is a subtly different than an anchorage, I guess, which have already been prohibited between Yonkers and Kingston. Um, but the mooring is being considered uh, approximately 150 yards southwest of Ernest R. Lasher Jr. Memorial Park and boat launch. Um, and it's being proposed on what we usually consider the recreational side of the river. Um, you know, when the 
dredging for the shipping channel on um, started, I don't know when, but I, you know, there was a big lit, uh, effort back in the 60s or 70s or so, we've kind of started to think of our side as the recreational side and the west side as the industrial side. Um, so there are various safety and visual concerns, um, but in this case, again, the applicant will have to obtain a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so um, in the process of obtaining that federal permit, a coastal consistency review will also have to be conducted through the New York State Department of State. And so again, if Germantown had an approved LWRP and all LWRPs include harbor management plans, um, so if we had an approved one, the applicant would have had to be consistent with our locally defined policies. Um, in this case, we were consulted as a part of a pre-planning process. Um, I don't believe a formal application has been submitted yet, but you know, we do plan to participate in the public comment period if and when it's submitted. Here on the next slide. Um, so uh, we're moving along with our LWRP. We picked a consultant this spring. Um, we actually selected a team that includes Peter, who spoke earlier uh, for many reasons, but a, a driving criteria for us and a big reason that we're pursuing this is for uh, familiarity with rail access issues. We had a kickoff meeting in July. This is a Zoom screenshot of our kickoff meeting. Um, and our first public outreach meeting is tentatively planned for October 23rd of this fall. Um, and we hope to be done by the end of 2022. Um, so there've been a lot of benefits so far. I mean, one of them is that the DOS staff um, from the state has attended our last two committee meetings. Um, so we can ask questions directly and we can understand kind of how they approach coastal consistency review. Um, you know, one example is back in 2018, our our committee had organized this big postcard writing campaign uh, to oppose the gates and fences proposal. And, um, you know, it felt like we were sending these postcards to this empty void of nothingness of the state, right? But now we know it was literally, we know Matt, he comes to our meetings now. It was his desk that they were all going to. So it's nice to be able to have a face to the name and he's now getting to know us and our concerns. And I think that it's, it's been really productive so far. Um, and the DOS has also helped us access resources that we didn't realize that we had for free. Uh, for example, our project manager, Lisa, pulled uh, the historic session laws from back in the 1800s, which define the precise boundary of our town. Um, we've also been invited to submit real property questions to the New York State Office of General Services Real Property Department regarding specific property access rights along the river. Um, so that's what hope, we hope that'll be really helpful. Um, next slide. So uh, I have a map here of uh, Germantown, some of our existing access that we want to preserve and some of the um, potential access that we're exploring through the, the LWRP process. Um, so as I mentioned, we have two at grade crossings, one on the north, that's Ernest R. Lasher Jr. Memorial Park, and on the south, we have Cheviot Park. Um, as I mentioned, so the purple, that's uh, been historically used by the public safely. It connects our parks um, on the river side of the tracks. Um, there's also a town-owned parcel but, um, just north of Cheviot Park at uh, what used to be an ice house. We call it Ice House Landing. Um, that we're trying to preserve access to that property. And overall, you know, we're concerned about erosion and sea level rise. You know, we're focused on figuring out how we can preserve these resources that we still have. Um, a couple of the newer um, projects that we're looking to use to expand river access, um, a lot of it has to do with formalizing what has been an informal public use. Um, so we, we want to make sure that we can formalize access to our town owned ice house landing. We want to make it an official campsite um, and have it be a part of the Hudson River water trail. Um, we want to formalize a rail width trail uh, between the two parks, um, you know, a, a completely designed and safe um, trail along the river, which is pretty rare on the Hudson. And we're also focusing on how to connect the Hamlet Center to the waterfront for economic development. So with either or maybe both um, a future sidewalk extension project down Lower Main Street to where we could add a new at grade crossing ideally. Um, 
And then there's another idea that's been identified by the town historian um, in the green there um, could, we're looking at the possibility for a trail that would go through the town park, past the parsonage, that's our, where our history department is, um, and then up to the Northern Waterfront Trail. Um, and then in orange, you'll see the Empire State Bike Trail is already going through our town. So we just see a lot of potential to connect the bike trail to maybe a two and a half mile Riverside Trail, which would be pretty amazing. So these are some of our, our grand ideas. Um, but, you know, I, I think that river access is huge. So, um, you know, I'm really excited about using the LWRP to preserve and expand that for Germantown. Fantastic, Jen. That's great work there by the town of Germantown's uh, LWRP committee and the Waterfront Advisory Committee and leaders uh, in this regard for uh, many years now. So back four or five years ago, when I had heard that the village of Castleton had lost its access at Scott Avenue, that the village of Tivoli had uh, entered into this agreement with CSX that They'd be sold the land, but once they had the land and once they developed the park, they would need a, an overpass to get to the riverfront. And then in Germantown, at the foot of Main Street, where people have been launching boats and mooring boats and swimming and fishing, um, a fence was proposed that would prevent that access. Um, I started thinking about uh, this kind of overpass versus pedestrian, at grade pedestrian crossing issue. And um, you know, it was apparent to me that about 24 trains passed by these communities daily. And, um, and, and the danger was there for maybe a minute or two per train. Now, what about the other 23 and a half hours of the day that people really need pedestrian overpass to get to the river uh, during the vast majority of the time the trains aren't coming? And that's when we commissioned McLaren to do the report about at-grade pedestrian crossings. And that report found that in other parts of the country, uh, particularly in Illinois, where there are high-speed lines run by Amtrak, there are at-grade pedestrian crossings where the trains go through communities. And the report also talked about the California shoreline where the Pacific surf liner goes along the ocean through this community of San Clemente. And there are a series of at grade pedestrian crossings to get to the beach there. And I wanted to find out some more information about that. How exactly did these at grade pedestrian crossings get permitted in California? Um, so last spring, um, where I teach at Marist College, of course, in environmental planning, uh, two very bright students, Danielle Dreyer and Logan Stone. Uh, Danielle is with us tonight. Thanks for being here, Danielle. Uh, they were looking for a project, and I suggested that they could do some research to find out how the California Coastal Commission permitted these crossings. And lo and behold, they got copies of the staff report and the permit from the California Coastal Commission, thanks to Zach Green, uh, who works there. And, um, and they documented all this, and they produced this report, this white paper, uh, by Marist College and Scenic Hudson, and I'm going to explain uh, how that process uh, came about. And you'll find the parallels between what happened in California and what's happening in New York State uh, very striking. Um, so first, I would like to say that this was all inspired uh, by a book by Jeff Olson. Uh, the book's called The Third Mode Towards a Green Society. Jeff worked for New York State DOT early in his career and is a bicycle pedestrian coordinator. And he quickly realized that New York State provided funding for transportation projects in two pots, highways and transit. And there was no funding for bicycles and pedestrian facilities. Um, and from that, he, um, he, he, wrote, he wrote this book, The Third Mode, which really uh, makes us take a, a hard look at life and, and, and the choices that are made, and that the choices are not uh, black and white, yes or no, Democrat and Republican, uh, but more, there's always a, a middle ground, a third way, and a way to uh, achieve 
goals uh, without sort of being on one side or the other. So um, Danielle and Logan, Logan really took a, a the third mode approach in their research uh, as the California Coastal Commission did. And um, this builds on that 2018 McLaren report and shows the precedent uh, that was set there in California. And uh, during this process, at grade pedestrian crossings were established and um, better fencing was also approved, which is something that uh, communities on the Hudson want as well. Uh, next slide. So prior to 2003, the people in San Clemente, California would walk along the high-speed passenger rail line and they'd, they'd cross wherever they wanted to get to their favorite fishing, swimming, or surfing spots. It wasn't really a, a trail. They would just walk along the tracks uh, or a side of the tracks. Uh, they'd get to their spot, they'd dash across the tracks and use the, the Pacific Ocean. And this uh, caused a lot of concern and there were a lot of incidents. Um, San Clemente's land use plan designated 18 different access points across the tracks. And these were informal access points. And many of them were just at the foot of a, a public stairway that would lead down the, the face of the bluff and end near the railroad. And while most people would cross at these locations, others just kind of walked along uh, the tracks and, and crossed wherever they wanted to. And there was really no fencing along the tracks at the time, just a little bit along the municipal pier. And the only public railroad crossings that were recognized by the California Public Utilities Commission were um, at the public pier, where there are two at the north end of the project, and then one down at Calafia State Park at the south end. So there was no access side of the tracks. Um, next slide. Uh, here's a map that uh, Danielle and Logan prepared. It shows the 2.3 mile um, stretch. Uh, those green dots are where there are at grade pedestrian crossings now. Um, and um, the California Public Utilities Commission, the railroads that operate here, Amtrak and um, BNSF, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, uh, and Caltrans, which is the State Department of Transportation, um, all um, um, objected to this plan that was um, applied jointly to the California Coastal Commission by the city of San Clemente and the Orange County Transportation Authority. Um, next slide. So here were the um, objections, the um, railroad agencies, felt that the increase in uh, there'd be uh, more pedestrians using it if this facility was formalized. Uh, there were already 2.3 million people uh, crossing the tracks to get to the beach at that time. Uh, they felt that it was incompatible with use as a high-speed rail corridor, that the um, pr providing at-grade crossings were not consistent with state and national uh, policy that is, is, is looking to eliminate uh, grade crossings uh, where possible. Uh, they thought that the trail was uh, too close to the tracks and that there just weren't enough safety measures proposed. Next slide. Um, the California Coastal Commission actually used state and local coastal policies, uh, just like uh, have been used um, to, to, uh, to get Amtrak to go back to um, engage the community and take a look at New York State and local coastal policies. And just like uh, the village of Tivoli is doing as they're upgrading their local waterfront revitalization program and as the um, town of Germantown is doing as they're upgrading theirs from a, a strategy to a program. Um, so what are the, the California coastal policies or, or here are some of the key ones um, that public access has to be provided from the nearest public roadway to the shoreline um, and along the coast that um, there's a priority for lower cost uh, vis visitor and recreational facilities. This is important because to provide a grade separated crossing might be $2 million or $3 million where an at grade crossing can be substantially less, sometimes in the vicinity of $50,000. Um, that's the California coastal policy. San Clemente the city had their own local policies, just like our local waterfront revitalization programs have that, that beaches are intended for maximum use. Uh, that the um, safety of uh, pedestrians uh, have to be considered. 
um, that they need a comprehensive network of improved beach facilities, and that uh, the, the city would pursue funding to maintain and improve existing access ways. And these access, access ways included um, both grade separated and at grade crossings. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there are a visual uh, and scenic and visual resource policies as well, just like we have here in New York. And, and in New York, I, I think they relate to fencing, where um, most of the fencing that was proposed along the Amtrak line was eight foot tall fencing, wrought iron fencing. Uh, they've come back and said there are some places where they can be uh, four or six feet uh, in parks. Um, but you can see here in California, the fencing is uh, more visually permeable and lower. Um, so the California Coastal Resource uh, Visual and Scenic Resources say that um, a development will protect views uh, to and along the ocean, minimize the alteration of natural landforms, and be visually compatible with the community character uh, there, in San, there in California. In San Clemente, very much the same. Uh, development needs to be cited and designed to protect public views and, uh, and be done with high quality in mind. Uh, next. So what did the uh, California Coastal Commission uh, conclude and what did, did they approve in 2004? Um, well, I like first this one state statement that public access and the safety of that access are naturally tied to one another. And I think this goes to the heart of the matter where it's not a matter of access or not, safety or not, we need to provide access in a safe way. Uh, the commission concluded that the, um, the trail that was designed, you see uh, part of the trail here, um, eliminates unsafe crossing and actually increases safety. So by um, including some of this low profile fencing, directing people to safe places to cross, some are overpasses, some are at grade crossings, uh, it greatly reduced uh, risk along the line. Um, they also found that grade separations are physically infeasible in many places and costly. Um, and that this proposal that provides a combination of different fencing, vegetation, barriers, and then this, an elevated walkway that channels pedestrian to the safe crossing points uh, is a way to get people to the beach, to the coast uh, uh, safely. Um, and then that, that lateral trail, the trail that goes along the railroad, that cow path that's been, that's been improved, um, now has better surface material drainage improvements so that people aren't walking through uh, mud uh, as, as they go on their way. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's a, a, another picture of some of the at-grade pedestrian crossing infrastructure. You can see uh, there's a nice smooth surface to get across. It's, it's a combination of asphalt and concrete. You see those flashing lights there. There are gates that come down. Uh, there are bells, uh, audible devices right there on the um, on the, on, the, on, the, on the crossing so that you don't have to wait to listen for the train coming. Uh, the warning is right there. Uh, if you happen to be inside when, they, when the, the gate closes, uh, there is a way you can get out, uh, a little escape valve that lets you out so you're not kind of stuck when the train's coming. Um, and then the fencing on each side of the crossing, uh, and it's about 150 feet on each side of the crossing, directs people to cross at the safe place instead of just kind of crossing anywhere they, they like to along the tracks. And then this was determined to be a safer way. Um, next. So here's some examples of some of the fencing. Uh, the railroad agencies wanted heavy duty, five to six foot chain link fencing uh, or wrought iron fencing. Uh, the California Coastal Commission agreed with the city of San Clemente that that type of fencing was not compatible with community values. This is something we've heard in Germantown where they've been looking for uh, other, other types of fencing other than this uh, four, six or eight foot tall wrought iron fencing there. They, they, in fact, I hear Germantown likes to call it um, barriers instead, uh, perhaps using vegetation or large rocks where possible. Uh, the commission found that um, the fencing along both sides of the tracks, um, at least that, that eight foot tall, the tall fencing would adversely impact views. And uh, they permitted this combination of low profile, visually permeable fencing and native vegetations and some stone riprap uh, that keep people from crossing the tracks in dangerous places. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. 
So based on all that, the report done by Danielle and Logan um, came up with some findings and recommendations uh, for the Hudson Valley. The um, parallels between San Clemente and the Hudson River lines are stunning. Uh, people are, are driven to get to the shoreline. They're concerned that fencing would um, block views and create a, a situation that is not compatible with community character. Um, the, uh, the need for grade separated crossings is uh, expensive, uh, visually intrusive, can't get a kayak across. Um, everybody wants to reduce risk uh, in California and here, whether it's the railroads or whether it's us. Um, and that state policies in both states protect access and views. Um, in California, they collaborated to reduce risk and increase access. I think we can do the same here. Um, and in California, they use the coastal consistency um, and the, uh, the California Coastal Commission did that. And our sister agency, the, the parallel agency to that New York State Department of State, we believe can do the same thing. Um, and we can use LWRPs to achieve our local uh, access and visual resource protection goals um, as well. Um, and the report recommended using modern at grade pedestrian crossings and low profile fencing, and that at Tivoli, Germantown, and Castleton on Hudson could be places where these types of projects could be um, installed. So I think at this point, I can explain that uh, there are things that you can do. Right after this, we're gonna get, we're gonna answer some questions. We want more questions uh, in the chat. You're gonna get a follow-up email with a lot of this information. So we'd like you to keep in touch with us. Uh, the documents that you've heard about today the at-grade pedestrian crossings report done by McLaren, the Hudson River Access Plan, and uh, the, uh, um, the Historic Trust Bridge Cultural Resource Survey, and the Marist College report on um, reducing risk along Hudson River rail lines uh, is all available at HudsonRiverAccess.org. And at, at that website, you can also send us your comment, provide us your email, because we'd like to keep in touch with you. Um, you can support the Calvert Box Preservation Alliance's effort to reopen the uh, Hoyt Carriageway Trust Bridge. We'll send you a link for that. We hope you'll um, visit some of these historic trust bridges. They're really cool. And, and I have to say that uh, the Hudson Valley has 12 of them within a 27-mile span. And to have 12 century-old trust bridges is, is, the, the, is, is quite a thing for us. So it's, 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 hopefully we can open some of them uh, real soon. Um, make sure your waterfront community has an up-to-date local waterfront revitalization program and that the LWRP protects shoreline access and is based on the Hudson River Access Plan recommendations. And remember, in that plan, we did a lot of public outreach and uh, people told us where they used the river and how they used the river. So that can be incorporated into your plan uh, to demonstrate that people are using the river at those places and that any actions that would reduce actions at those places would be inconsistent with the local waterfront revitalization plan. Um, um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, check on this, but we believe that the uh, House transportation bill has got some, uh, uh, some provisions, still has some provisions that uh, require Amtrak to provide notification. Um, and and if, if they're still there, we want you to let Senators Schumer and Gillibrand know that the Senate bill should reflect that as well. Um, we'll send you some up-to-date information in a follow-up email. Please support Assemblymember Barrett's bill. Uh, and uh, as Vanessa explained, uh, write to the assembly member, the chair of the committee, and the Senate sponsors as well. That's important. We're going to send you all those emails in a follow-up uh, email. Um, and then we hope that you understand the benefits of at grade pedestrian crossings, um, some of the, 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 the context of these and where they can be um, implemented along the uh, Empire Corridor South. So um, right now we're gonna, we're gonna go to a couple questions. Um, we have a question about how, can I explain how Marlboro, oh, the question just went away, how Marlboro, how Marlboro, I'm gonna go by, the, Sorry. How Marlboro won their at-grade crossing. So this was a situation where there was uh, an existing crossing uh, from upland across the tracks to a very thin sliver of land, very much like, like you'll find in Tivoli. 
Um, back, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, there was a, a small oil terminal there uh, and a dock. Um, Cena Cutson helped the town of Marlboro purchase that uh, property. Um, so it may be that uh, that crossing was still a legal at grade crossing at the time. And the town of Marlboro secured grants to create a park there. And they knew that a, an at grade crossing would, um, would, would consume a lot of room there, it would be very expensive, be hard to maintain, couldn't get kayaks across it. So they uh, petitioned the Department of Transportation in a, um, they, they have a, um, a legal process that allows communities to petition about grade crossings. And they uh, convinced the Department of Transportation to allow um, an at-grade crossing to, to remain. Uh, emergency vehicles can cross, there'll be um, better gates and fencing. In fact, there are no gates there now, it's just cross bucks. So it's actually quite a dangerous situation now. So that grade crossing will be improved. Um, I was at some of those meetings, they were um, adjudicatory hearings. And um, as I recall, the Federal Railroad Agency was um, pretty hard nosed about requiring eight foot fencing. Um, and uh, the town of Marlboro really didn't want that type of fencing. So I think that's a, an outstanding uh, concern there. And I'd like to work with uh, the town uh, to try to get some better fencing in the park. Um, so that's, um, that's what we did. And I'd love to um, put you in touch with the town of Marlboro to, um, and maybe they can provide a, a little more information. Um, another question came in was how would um, uh, an at grade crossing and opening that park in Castleton uh, help the local economy and who would hold the liability, uh, the village or the railroad if this happens? Well, we heard from both Tivoli and um, Germantown that they both recognize that by having a good riverfront access, formal access, safe access at their riverfront would help the businesses in their community. Um, and those businesses are up the hill and, and quite a distance from the riverfront. Uh, in Castleton, the businesses are right around the corner from the grade crossing there at Scott, Scott Avenue. So um, I, I think it, it, it just is sort of a no brainer that if, um, if, if formal access were to be provided at, at uh, Castleton, uh, the people that go there to enjoy the river, maybe to launch a kayak, to fish, uh, would also want something to eat, something to drink. They may walk, uh, some of those stores may be redeveloped uh, and they would, could buy things at those stores. Um, also, just having that access would provide a great uh, amenity for the people that live in the village of Castleton on Hudson. And I recall, in 2020, when we had a meeting in Castleton, one of the comments was that uh, the school children don't have a place to go to the river to study um, the environments and to study the Hudson River. So just by providing a park down at Castleton uh, would, would give school children a, a way to connect with the Hudson River there. So who would uh, have the liability at, at that grade crossing? Well, there are uh, at grade crossings, um, uh, in different locations. Uh, I'm not sure if the uh, Barrett bill, which addresses rail with trail and access along the tracks would cover a situation like that, but it would be, um, it would be uh, at least safer because there would be um, protected by gates and audible devices. Um, there was a question, would the, uh, uh, Castleton Crossing be considered existing, such as is in um, Marlboro. I'm not sure if when the Department of Transportation transferred that land to the village, if they um, closed that crossing, uh, legally closed it, or if they just put a, a gate in front of it. So that's something I think the village would have to find out. Um, I think there was a question for Jen, right? Oh, I see that. I didn't realize it was directed directly towards me. Um, we did not originally budget for surveying of the Ice House parcel, um, but I do believe that uh, it was the last year or the year before the town did fund um, a thorough review by with the town attorney to confirm our title to it. So, you know, there is progress on that front. And, um, you know, a survey is certainly something we would include as a part of our plan 
um, you know, when we finished in LWRP, in addition to the federal uh, regulatory impact, um, it also helps us get more grant funding from the state. Um, and so, you know, the idea behind it is that we identify projects um, and we use this plan or program to um, enact them, right? And so that's certainly something that we could um, say needs to be part of the next steps. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, once you have an a, approved LWRP, it, it puts you in better stead to get uh, state funding. And um, we, I invited Jamie Ethier from the Department of State to be here tonight. He couldn't be here, but he said that we uh, could give his email address uh, and people should reach out uh, to Jamie at the Department of State to find out how their community can, um, can work on a, an LWRP. So that will be forthcoming in the uh, uh, follow-up email. Ah, how can our community find funding to prepare an LWRP? Uh, you will get, you could get that through a, uh, a CFA grant, Consolidated Funding Application. The New York State Department of State has um, annual grant program that provides funding to do an LWRP. And um, that um, the 2021 uh, round just closed, but there'll sure be another round in 2022. And I will direct you to Jamie Ethier to find out more about that. And um, the, the question about money to survey the ice house parcel um, um, reminds me of, of an important uh, concept. And that is uh, sur the, the importance of surveys and uh, title searches. Um, we like to, you know, we hear all the time and we heard it in California, the, the California Coastal Commission heard this and we hear it here that, um, th that being on the railroad right of way is trespassing. And uh, that's certainly the railroad's position. Uh, but uh, things may not quite be so cut and dry as that. In 1850, when New York State granted the right of way to the railroad, um, they granted them the right of way to run trains along that, to build the railroad and run trains alongside. A lot of that right of way was constructed uh, right along the shore. And in some cases, um, out in the river where Phil was placed on um, lands owned by the people of the state of New York. Uh, and you can use your imagination and look in a lot of places, you'll see that the railroad is out in the river uh, or in a place where there's a lot of flat land between the railroad and the toe of the slope. Um, and that was probably built on fill. Uh, and if the railroad was built on fill, the state may, uh, the people of the state, uh, the public may have a right through the public trust doctrine to cross the tracks to get to the shoreline. Um, and adjacent property owners may have the right to cross the tracks to get to the shoreline. This, in, unless the railroad um, bought that, those rights from the upland property owner. Um, this needs to be established through um, time consuming and expensive title searches. And we're still figuring out how we can get the funding uh, to do that. But that's certainly one of the needs um, that we foresee. Uh, John Cody is giving a big shout out uh, to Peter Maliski, uh, who was a great help when um, John and his um, colleagues from the city of Hudson uh, fought and successfully beat back the siding of an oil refinery in Hudson in the 1980s. And, and he says, thank you. And, and I believe uh, on that land now there is, um, I believe there's some public parks there now. Uh, Sarah Sterling is asking, what about flooding and sea level, rising water levels? Um, yeah, I think we know that there is flooding, there's going to be uh, rising water levels. And, um, you know, the question is, um, what do you do? That, that's a whole nother uh, topic for another uh, seminar. But, um, you know, there are ways you can, um, you can armor the shoreline. They've got some very, um, you know, they're disadvantaged with armoring the shoreline. You can uh, create a sustainable shoreline and let, the water come up and protect it with plantings um, and some rocks. Um, but and sometimes the shoreline has to be built up uh, to get out of the 100-year flood plain. So if, if you want to have, if you've got low-lying land along the river and it's a park, uh, at some point it's probably going to be elevated or it's going to be raised. Um, a question, uh, will the change in the governor's office impact this issue? Um, and uh, we don't know. Um, but I think we have to um, just operate with the knowledge we have and, and continue to press to make our case. Um, the Department of State has not yet given us any feedback 
on the river access report. I think it, well, if you mean the um, Hudson River access plan, uh, the feedback was that communities should be using the, um, the data. That's sort of the, the facts and figures about who's using the, the river where, the findings and the recommendations. Um, you can just take things out of there like the public trust doctrine um, and, and some of the findings and recommendations from that plan, put it right into your LWRP. Uh, let's see. How fast do trains go on the Hudson line? Can we expect that they'll be going faster? Um, Peter Maliski can probably answer that pretty well. I know I've heard him answer it many times. Uh, and rather than by memory, uh, we'll see if Peter can, uh, can work on that because he worked on the New York State um, uh, High Speed Rail Program, the FEIS for that. So Peter? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, so for a number of years, I was working with the, I was the project manager actually for the consultant working with DOT on doing the, the, uh, uh, the draft environmental impact statement for the high speed rail study in New York that's been sort of sitting on the shelf for the last five years or so. But in the, so a lot of the improvements for high speed rail um, would happen between Albany and Buffalo. There's a, a, a a large opportunity for improvements there. And anyone who's taken a train between Albany and Buffalo knows that it's kind of a crapshoot when you'll get there and when you'll come back. Um, between Albany and New York City, Penn Station, it's pretty reliable ser uh, service now. In fact, when we did the study, it wasn't as much about speed that people were concerned about. It was more about reliability. Will the train leave on time? Will it get there on time? And especially with today's technology, when you have your phone, you can do your laptop and the train and so forth. You, you can conduct business or uh, social media and so forth. People aren't too concerned if it's going to be two hours to Albany or two hours and 15 minutes to Albany. It's more, is it going to be reliable? Am I going to make, meet my next meeting and so forth? Uh, regarding speeds, because of the geometrics along the river, because of the tight uh, right away, because of a lot of the uh, historic towns and so forth right across the river, there's very little room for improvement. They get high speed rail. High speed rail is really um, defined as over 90 miles an hour or over 100 miles an hour. This is really um, what Amtrak has now on the Empire Quarter South is higher speed rail. And um, to get that much faster, you'd have to build out into the water and straighten the alignments out and so forth, which isn't gonna happen. There are some locations, um, you know, between on the Northern end, um, between near Castleton up to Albany and so forth, where they do approach speeds over, they're over 90 miles an hour, 95 miles an hour. Um, most of the speeds are approximately around 80 um, is their maximum speed. In fact, you see a lot of signs now that they posted that say speeds may be over 80 miles an hour. But um, if, if it's right there in the report, if you, if you just Google, um, you know, New York State High Speed Rail Draft EIS, it's right in there. And it really, I mean, there's a lot of paper you have to go through, but it basically tells you there's very little room for improvement. So from Albany South, the trains aren't going to get much faster, if any faster. Um, they're just going to be more reliable uh, as far as the switching stations and things like that. Um, and one thing that um, Jeff did a great job in covering the... Um, at great crossings. One thing I would like to mention, though, is in California, in Illinois, um, the standard nowadays is there's an 80 second delay between the, when the gates go down and when the train appears. At Castle and Hudson, for example, I was out there myself and timed it, it was 15 seconds. So simple changes like that. Um, along with the geometrics and using the modern technology, but simple things changes like that. Instead of having a 15 second notice, having an 80 second notice uh, can make a world of difference. Thanks, Peter. Let's see, more questions for any of the panelists? We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Well, then I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all our panelists, uh, Peter Maleski, Vanessa Komarnicki, Emily Major, Jen Crawford, 
um, Miranda Miller, uh, Rob Bury, thanks for being here tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, thank all of you for joining us. Please expect a follow-up email from Scenic Hudson. Don't forget to visit the website, hudsonriveraccess.org, and see you all on the river.